uh, thinking a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to go through um, all of the slightly wordy slides which are at the front end of your document. Um, I'll just pick up one or two. Um, those of you who know a little bit about SA Partners will know a little bit about our work with uh, Cogent Steel going back some years ago. Um, the, the little booklet, excuse me, the little booklet Staying Lean um, is actually a Shingo Prize winner for research. Uh, those of you who haven't read it, um, it's available, I recommend you do. Most people tell us that it's a very accessible read. Uh, it describes a story of an organisation which was, broadly speaking, going out of business. Uh, in fact, not broadly speaking, very specifically speaking, was going out of business and uh, turned itself around using lean thinking and is now a very successful and profitable organisation. Um, I'll say no more about that. The, the key point here is the, the imagery of the iceberg model, which makes the sort of point that we've been talking about today, that uh, you can go and visit, um, what was it, Mitsubishi, was it you went to see? Mitsubishi and it's shining and beautiful and everything is as you would expect it to see. What you can't quite see um, outside of the physical appearance of the place is what goes on underneath. What are the, what are the, what's the thinking, the behaviour, the culture that enables all of that beautiful glossy lean tools and techniques on the factory floor to sustain and evolve and develop further, okay? And so the, the purpose of these two days is to try to help us to get inside this. What is it that sits underneath? Because we all know that simply the application of tools and techniques on their own is very, very hit and miss. It's very hit and miss. And actually, if I'm honest, probably more miss than hit. Okay? That might not be such a bad thing, by the way. Come back to that. So we're looking at um, largely what's below the waterline. Uh, this is a little bit wordy. It's one of probably just two slides with lots of words on that I want to flag up at the beginning of the workshop, just to really orientate ourselves. And what we're trying to do here is to recognize that without individual and organizational learning, there isn't any sustainable performance improvement. Actually, what sits at the heart of this is the ability for, of people to interact in such a way that they learn to improve. And that is true at the level of an individual. So my interaction with you can either enable you to learn or limit your learning. It's sort of as straightforward as that. It gets more complex when we come up to the level of the organisation, but the principle remains the same. At an organisational level, what we're trying to do is to get to the point where individuals as, and groups of people are enabled to learn and improve rather than limited in their ability to learn and improve. And later on through the course of today, will give you some very specific insights into how it's possible to, in the language we're using, talk in continuous improvement or talk out continuous improvement. Okay? I do apologise for this Skype thing, which uh, somebody, somebody with a technical bent can tell me how I stop Skype just coming into my laptop every 10 minutes. Um, and the, I think the other key point here is that often when people are interested in organisational change and culture change, they often have a belief that what they're about to set off doing is a massive thing. It's a big change. It requires massive resources. And again, at some level that's true. It does and it might. But actually there are very, very powerful changes that we can affect in other people through making small changes in the way we ourselves behave. And we'll show you some of those today. Okay? Small changes can have disproportionately large effects. The issue is the disproportionately large effects can go in one of two directions. They can be disproportionately positive or they can be disproportionately negative. The gentleman at the back who talked about um, uh, going into some organisations and coming across examples of behaviour which are broadly abusive. Um, I think, fortunately, there aren't so many of those organisations around anymore. Um, but for those that, that are around, what chance is there of creating an environment of continuous improvement? Absolutely zero. Absolutely zero. None of that aggressive, bullying, overly assertive behaviour 
does anything towards establishing a culture of improvement. Um, this, uh, this little point here is making a, a, so I don't mind craning my neck to look around here because it's on the screen in front of me. Um, Lean business improvement often plateaus. I'm not suggesting that your business improvement has plateaued, but if you take something very simple, the first time you get into doing improvement, you might do something like get a team together, try to run some 5S activity, produce a value stream map, identify projects for improvement, etc., etc. And what happens at that point is there's enormous energy, enormous energy and enthusiasm, and it feels like the world is going to change very dramatically. And then six months down the line, things have remained pretty much as they were. Or if sometimes they've even gone backwards. Okay? Whether it's at the beginning or it's further down the line, organizations sometimes get to the point where they ask the question, what do we do now? And it might be that some of you are at that stage. And so I think our position as a business is that if you're going to embark on a process of improvement and there are many tools available, all the stuff above the waterline, get on and use it. Go and experiment and play and learn and make some progress with the tools, but knowing that in the back of your mind at some point you're going to have to come back to the question of what do we do about behaviour? Because that's the issue around sustainability. Okay, I'm going to jump forward a little bit because what I'd like to do, um, I'd like you to turn to page five in your book. And um, I said at the beginning that we are very generous in, uh, in what it is we have to offer you, so we thought we'd start with the answer. Okay, we thought we'd start with the answer. You've come a long way, you've given up two days, you might be getting bored at this stage, so you, I'll make this input and you can have a cup of coffee and you've got the answer and you, know, you can stay if you'd like to, but you can go home. Uh, I'm being sarcastic. Um, we actually have done quite a lot of thinking about what it is that we think leaders in particular need to be good at to sustain a climate and a culture of continuous improvement. And what are the sorts of behaviours, or as we prefer to call them, dispositions, that one might want to see in the organisation. And we've tried to keep this very simple and we've used a combination of desk research and experiential observation from our consulting work to keep things to a simple number of five. So we, psychologists tell us we can tend to remember anything between five and seven things. They're obviously overly optimistic, so we've kept it at the low end of the range. Uh, it's just five, okay? And um, I'd just like to run through these with you very briefly. So the first one is a disposition of urgency. And so we've defined this as the intention of acting on issues quickly and thoroughly. And it's the combination of those two factors that's important, acting on issues um, <coughs> quickly and thoroughly. By quickly, what we're referring to is at the point where we see a problem, an issue, an opportunity, a risk in the business, we don't let it lie, we don't let it fester, we get onto it and start to address it. And by thoroughly, what we mean is the way we start to address it is with some rigour, not some simple reactive behaviour or firefighting behaviour. So it's the combination of the two. Urgency here does not mean firefighting. Urgency is a particularly the point where we recognise there is an issue or a problem and we get onto it really, really fast. And a very, very simple reason for that is that we know if issues and problems are allowed to fester or lie untackled in the organisation, they always start off as small problems and they very quickly become big problems. And big problems are difficult to solve. It's big problems that require heavy investments. Small problems that are within the realm of people's capacity to understand and deal with it are both easier to deal with and developmental for the people who are trying to deal with them. Okay? So urgency is really critical. To what extent is the disposition of urgency 
a disposition that either you exhibit personally or something that you see inside your operations. Okay. Um, the, the second one, which is my favourite, if we're allowed to have favourites in this film, um, is proximity. And this is the, um, the disposition of being close to and interested in the people and the work that they do. The final part of that statement is really critical. It's interested in the work that they do. And we could probably say, or adds to that, and, and the improvements that people are making. Okay? So I'd like to contrast two different ways of managers being interested in their people. The first is what I call the classic regal tour. And this is where a senior person comes down into the operation and walks past Fred and says, Hello Fred, how are you doing? How are the wife and kids? And did you see the game on Saturday? It's a very nice piece of social convention and it, makes, it provides Fred with a little bit of a warm glow that you know, the boss is interested in him and the boss leaves and goes away. And that's been very nice but broadly has contributed nothing to the betterment of the organisation. The other possibility is the boss comes down and sees Fred and says to Fred, hey Fred, how's it going? I know you've been working on one or two improvement activities recently and I've got five minutes. Can you give me an update on the progress that you're making, the sorts of problems you're encountering? Okay? And that is a completely different type of interaction. And if there is some authentic motive behind that question. In other words, if the boss is doing that because he believes and understands that engaging in that type of dialogue with somebody is likely to fuel their interest and enthusiasm for improvement, then he's doing absolutely the right thing, or she's doing absolutely the right thing. If it's driven out of a, a, some sense of technique, then the other person will see through it quite quickly, and it will be useless. So it has to be really authentic. But proximity, being close to people, interest in the work that they do is a really important disposition. Do you exhibit it? Do you see it in place inside your organisations? Um, collaboration, uh, this unfortunately is one of the words which is, has become a little bit hackneyed, it's a little bit in common use and it loses a bit of meaning. So I want to say something important about it, which is that um, it is vital for continuous improvement because most people cannot solve organisational issues and problems and exploit opportunities and manage risks without the support of their co-workers. Okay? But what we also know is collaboration is quite difficult to achieve. We know two things about collaboration. It's difficult to achieve and when we achieve it we get better results than without it. It's difficult to achieve because psychologically most of us prefer to work with people who are like ourselves, even if we tend not to admit it. But most, the best results in human endeavour seem to come about where people who are different from each other work together and find a way of managing their differences. So the, the classic piece of research around this, if people are looking for a reference point, would be the Belbin team roles research. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. A few nods. So we've probably got a few sort of resource investigators and plants in the room and people like that. Um, the research behind that is really interesting because the research behind that um, centred on the Apollo space mission in the 1970s when uh, Belbin thought the best way to solve problems is have the cleverest people in the world solve them. Who are the cleverest people in the world? Well, they're people who work at NASA. So they started to do some research, brought people together from NASA, highly intelligent people, you know, everybody, at least six PhDs, um, and he gave them problems to solve. And what he found was that generally they were useless. At a, at a collaborative level, they struggled. And I'll keep this story short. Lots and lots of research bringing into play different types of people with different profiles. And what he found was that when there was a balanced range of styles and personalities amongst a team, those teams tended to outperform teams or groups where people had a particular dominant personality type or trait. Okay? 
And since that piece of work, there have been other pieces of work which, amazingly enough, say exactly the same thing. Biology likes diversity, human beings don't like it. But diversity of thinking is necessary for good collaborative outcomes. Okay, so there's something quite, quite important and quite deep about this. Um, so the question here is, how effective is collaboration? And by collaboration, what I don't mean is that everyone gets on with everybody. Because let's be realistic, in organisations, there ain't that many people that get on with that many people. Uh, most, if I were to talk to you about the levels of disagreement or conflict inside your organisations, you would all have very rich stories to tell. Okay? That, because actually what we're engaging with are differences between us. So it's not that there isn't conflict, it's that there is a level of maturity and understanding that helps us to manage conflict effectively. Okay? That calls on some very good interpersonal skills to do that well. Uh, reflection. Um, so this is a, a different way, I think, and maybe this would have been a better word for learning. It's about the extent to which, either as individuals, we take time to understand, literally to check, to check on what it is we've been doing and whether what we've been doing is taking us in the right direction or not. And at an organisational level, whether we institutionalise processes of reflection. So there is, and I've almost given it away, there is a very simple and very powerful technique in the Lean Signal world for driving reflection. What is it? Plan, do, check, act. Who uses PDCA as a systematic routine in their business improvement activities? Yeah. Shingo Man would? Maybe three of them. Maybe, which of the three you use? Um, something to plan. You've overstated it, haven't you? It's not three, is it? <laughs> it's a bit of plan, it's loads of do. What's the check thing about? And because we haven't done the check, we can't redo really the act. So this is really, I think, an important point that PDCA is a really, really simple concept. And I think that's why it's not used. Because it's not difficult enough for clever people to get their head around. OK? So it is so simple, but very, very powerful. What are we planning to do? And by the plan, it's not what are the steps we're taking, but what are the outcomes we're looking for. So all it is is a hypothesis. I think that if I throw this bottle from here to the end of the room, it's going to smash and the water's going to go everywhere. And it'll splay out across an area of four metres. That's my assumption, but I don't know until I've thrown it. Okay, so I throw it, and I see what happens. I won't throw it, I won't throw it, don't worry. I throw out and I see what happens. Then I check what actually happened. Were the outcomes that I got those that I predicted? Yes or no? doesn't matter. Because what I'm doing is, if it's confirmed my expectation, I know that my understanding is at a very strong level. And I might have to repeat the exercise several times. If I get a different outcome, actually I've moved into a zone of learning. That's interesting. I thought I'd get this, but actually I've got that. Why is there that difference? And what do I need to do to get a different outcome next time? So the check is a piece of institutionalised reflection. It's, it's formally driving learning. And it's a really important idea because it's assuming that improvement is about experimentation and improvement carries with it the likelihood of, of failure against expectations. And that's OK. In fact, not only is that OK, that is part of the process. That's why when you will have started your lean improvement journeys and you might have done some 5S or whatever it was or a value stream app and it didn't work perfectly, that's absolutely fine. The question is what did you do when it didn't work properly? How much time did you take to try to understand why and to correct that? If you didn't and you had people above you saying, well, I've just spent £20,000 on that and I've got no return and that clearly proves it doesn't work and I'm not interested anymore, it's the wrong thinking associated with the wrong type of inquiry, associated with the ability to talk out continuous improvement rather than talking it in. Okay. 
Uh, and then finally, um, challenge. So I think you've sort of asked this, answered my PDCA question. I, I think it's probably fair to say that for most of SA guys, when we work in organisations, most organisations, before they start to work with us, get about a quarter of a way around the PDCA cycle. They sort of embarrass you, it's a slightly embarrassed conversation. How far, well we do a bit of planning and we're really good at the doing, and it all goes a bit quiet. And if you get exactly the same conversation at every level in the organisation, you can talk to the management team, you go down to the shop floor, what do you, how far around this cycle do you go? I don't really go very far around that cycle. Okay. What difference would it make to improvement if people simply started to go around that circuit cycle? I could talk for about an hour on this, so I'll stop. Um, challenge. Uh, challenge in this sense is about stretch, but, but there is some, um, some thoughtfulness required to this, because this is not challenge which sets people ridiculously high targets without an understanding of what their capability might be in the first place. Okay, stretch is about having some understanding about where people or a part of the organisation is, what its current capability is, and working out how it could be better than that. Okay? But stretch is important because, and particularly when it's self-generated, stretch is important because it drives improvements in performance and it also drives learning, so long as it's managed well. So we have a view that, um, and I think the way we'd like to position this with you is that it's not the answer, it's a perspective. It's a perspective based on our learning and understanding, okay? And our encouragement to you is that what you do with something like this, you take something like this and you think about it in relation to your context. And you say, yeah, it's actually quite interesting. I'm not sure about that challenge thing for us, for whatever reason. But proximity, actually, there's something important in there that we haven't really thought about before. So what would we need to do about that? There's a little um, further, a couple of further variations on this. Um, each of our dispositions, and we apply this framework to a, a number of concepts, has three levels, skill, inclination, and sensitivity. So if we think about a disposition of proximity, for instance, um, I might well have the skill to have the right conversation with you at the right point in time. I might be interested in the work that you do and I know how to have that conversation. I'm skillful at doing it. The question is, do I have the inclination or tendency? Can I be bothered? Is this something I believe and feel is important for me to do? Okay, because I could have the skill, but I might just not use it. Or I might not have the skill, but I might be inclined to give it a go. And the third item is sensitivity. And this is the critical one. Do I spot the occasion when it's necessary to go and have that type of conversation or to engage in that piece of behaviour? Or does it just pass me by? So I might have the skill, and I, I might in a workshop setting with somebody like... Kevin or Mick or Steve or Donna, be able to demonstrate that I have the skill and I could either have or pretend I have the inclination. But when I get back into the real world, am I sensitive to the moment? Do I know that actually I'm tuned into the fact I need to go and talk to David about his particular piece of continuous improvement activity today? Now is the right time to do that. Or do I miss it? We'll talk a little bit later about what we see in relation to coaching. Coaching is a great example of this because we know that lots of managers have some skills in coaching, although some have terrible skills. Most managers view coaching as an important thing to do. It's socially desirable. They want to do it. And in the wild, and I'll make a strong statement here, most managers don't see the opportunities for coaching most of the time for reasons that I'll come on to explain later. So if you're developing dispositions and you're only focusing on skill, you're missing two-thirds of the picture. It will not be enough to stick people inside coaching skills workshops and expect there to be a change in behaviour in the operation. Other things are needed. 
So skill, inclination, sensitivity um, relates to each of the dispositions. And uh, let me just check that you can see that with the lighting. And we think the dispositions um, are composed of two things, um, the hard and the soft. Okay, so although this workshop is looking primarily at what goes on below the waterline, um, and in this sense, in relation to any of the dispositions, this will be the application of thoughtful interactions. On the other side, it's concerned with the thoughtful, applica thoughtful application of lean tools. So what I mean by that is, if we take something like um, uh, urgency as a disposition, on the one hand, there will be a number of tools, lean tools, that I might want to use to drive urgency. I might, for example, want to measure how long it's taking from the point where a problem is identified to the point where a problem is solved. I might want to measure that because typically organisations don't. And if I measure that, I will be applying the hard side of the disposition. On the other hand, I might be wanting to have a conversation with somebody which is encouraging them to move ahead on a piece of improvement activity faster than they ordinarily would want to. So I have to engage in my interactional skills to be able to do that. The disposition of urgency would play out through the combination of the hard and the soft. So we have these very interesting conversations about, yes, there are the lean tools, but there's all this behavioral stuff we need to think about as well, as if they are different things. But actually what they are is different, different sides of the same coin. It's very difficult to get continuous improvement only with the tools. It's very difficult to get continuous improvement only with the behavior because the tools provide structure that enables behavior, and the behavior facilitates the use of the tools. So there's a combination of things here. And then just one more slide, and then um, I'm just checking my time. Um, we'll give you a chance to um, think about this a little bit. Uh, so why are these things? So I, I, may have, um, I may have said a little bit about these already, so let me just fly through this. Urgency increases the pace and breadth of issue resolution, avoiding small problems becoming big ones. That's why that disposition is important. Proximity engages people. So it's very interesting. There's a, there's a huge industry about employee engagement. And there are about as many measurement tools and employee engagement as there seem to be employees. So I don't know how people manage to make money out of that, but someone does somewhere. Um, but the question I'd like you to ask yourself is when somebody who is leading you spends time with you, and they spend time with you asking you in a very genuine way what your work is like, what challenges you're facing, what what progress you're making, what help you need. And they do that with you on a fairly regular basis. And your colleagues even engage in similar sorts of dialogue with you. How engaged do you end up being? Okay? For me, the answer is really simple. You end up being bloody engaged, seriously engaged. And that piece, that piece of behavior is critical to it. I'm not sure you have to ask anybody whether they have a best friend at work, but that's me being cynical about something else. Um, collaboration, uh, leveraging diversity improves the quality of issue resolution. Leveraging diversity. Okay? Difference makes a difference. Sameness gives us what we've already be, always been having. And this is, there's something of an interpersonal or intrapersonal challenge here, you know, which is the extent to which you might be deliberately seeking to work with people who have different perspectives from your own. It's a very, very challenging thing to do. Um, thinking and learning well is at the heart of improvement effort. I think I've made that point. And well-designed challenges that require thought and effort are motivational, enhancing learning and performance. This is why, why challenge is important. So why these dispositions? There could be others. 
we don't have perfect answers on the world, but what we have had is time to research the literature, think hard about our consulting practice over the last 15 years, and try to say these might be things that organizations would want to focus on to try to think about getting the right types of behaviors inside organizations, but think about them in just a slightly different way. We'll also take this down an, a, a level later on today. Um, oh, there we are. Oh, here was, here was a different example. So this one is proximity. Um, so on the one hand, the soft side of the equation is the quality of the improvement conversation. How good a conversation am I having with somebody? And I illustrated that simplistically with David. Um, the other side of proximity, which is a hard rather than a soft issue, is putting managers where the work is. Okay, so lo locating people close to the work. So we've been involved in a number of organizations where I think as we heard on this table, um, the guys are on the shop floor and the managers are off in the office somewhere. Chances of making improvement happen while that physical difference exists, just about zero. Okay? Bring the people down, skill them, get them engaged and communicating effectively and there's always a significant productivity improvement simply by making that change. Can I ask you a question? Of course, this is what have I'm here worked, for. Have you worked with companies that uh, are big into whatever you call it, offshoring, nearshoring, whatever? How do you overcome this when the senior management is in the hubs and people that are close to the customer are in another country, for example? Yeah, very difficult. Uh, I haven't much experience in that area. I have a little bit of experience with one of the banks going back, I don't know, six years or so. But it was very marginal and I think it's extremely difficult. And I think the, um, the issue of offshoring itself, you know, one might argue, is, is economically flawed because it's fundamentally not focused on customer value. It's focused on economies of scale. Yep. And so you're, you're, you're never really going to drive the right sort of culture with that. And it's interesting, a number of organisations are pulling back from that arrangement now. I just look at the guys at the back. I don't know, Steve Mick, whether you have experience of working in uh, offshore environments. There may be some other people in the room who could um, help with that. Okay, um, so here's a question for you. Um, I'll allow you to do a couple of things at this point. I'll allow you to stand up in a second and stretch your legs, and if you need a comfort break, please go ahead, um, although coffee won't be available until 11 o'clock, but you may want to just take two minutes now. Um, when you come back, to your tables, I'd like you to think about this question. How well developed are the lean dispositions inside your organizations? Okay, so I'm gonna keep it at a very general level. It's probably worth, I probably should have made the point earlier that as a, as a two day workshop, we're giving you snippets of stuff. Okay, we're, we're exposing you to, to ideas, concepts, frameworks, that we tend to use in our consulting work, but we're not going down into massive detail in each area because, frankly, we don't have time for that. We're trying to give you enough to stimulate your thinking and hopefully enable you to go away and do something with what you've been learning, okay? So I recognize this question is a very global question, but I think it has to be at that level because of the type of event that we're in today. So the question is, how well developed are lean dispositions in your organization? I'd like you to Think about that question and we'll take some feedback as we have done previously. Okay. Any, any questions just before we get into that? Because I'm conscious I've been talking at you a bit. 
Observations, disagreements, controversies? Good. <clears throat> okay. Do you say you're happy? Yeah. It's far too early to be happy. That's what I'm saying now. Oh, that's what you're saying now. Well done. Good, good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, perfect. Over to you.